we will now start the first session and uh, we will hear two talks. We have uh, Norman Huck and Carola Hein and we will start with Norman. And um, I'm very glad that uh, you are here, Norman. Welcome. And, uh, Norman Huck is an architect and researcher in the field of digital building fabrication. And he studied in Wismar in Vienna at the University of Technology at the Architectural Association where he did his master in emergent technologies and design. And um, after graduating, he went to the architecture office Herzog de Meuron to work uh, in the, as a programming architect, which is probably not about room program, but more about coding, uh, because it was in the digital technologies group at HDM. And this deepened research or interest in, in digital design um, let him go back into research. He started a PhD position at Gramatio Cola Research at the ETH in Zurich, where he received his doctorate in 2018. And currently, Norman Huck is junior professor for digital building fabrication at the Institute for Structural Design at the TU Braunschweig. Um, in Norman's research, he's challenging conventional ways of processing concrete, and he investigates reinforcement strategies for 3D printed concrete, a topic which is uh, not often cover covered when it comes to 3D printing. Uh, but I, I kind of like the story how this research unfolded from something that in the beginning went into a slightly different direction. But um, let uh, Norman tell the story. Very welcome. Thank you for being here and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Oliver, for the introduction. I'll just um, start sharing my screen and set up everything. So we do it like this. Hold on, need to optimize it. Share. All right, um, I can't see you anymore. But I hope you can see my screen. Is that correct? Can I? Yes, we see your screen. Yeah, okay, oh, perfect. Um, yeah, thank you again, Oliver, for the introduction and the uh, spontaneous possibility to stand in for another speaker. I already had the pleasure to present at the first Beam Symposium, I think it was in 2016, where I presented um, my, at that time, ongoing research um, uh, of Gamazio Kola. And uh, last year, the head of our institute, Harald Kloft from TU Braunschweig, uh, presented our current work on um, shockwave 3D printing. So uh, for today, um, what I want to do is to um, present as well our current investigations into reinforcement strategies for additive manufacturing and I want to kind of um, bridge this time from uh, the first presentation and um, until now and um, present today how this related or how this work is a kind of continuous or shows a continuous thread. So uh, recently we have published a classification approach on reinforcement strategies for additive manufacturing which is um, kind of broadly divided into three categories. Firstly, we have a category um, of reinforcement techniques where the concrete um, supports the reinforcement during um, the process of printing. For example, um, there's a, a core is being printed and then rods are being placed or, or carbon tapes are laid, uh, nails are shooted or um, for example, fibers are dispersed into um, the concrete stream. So this is a, a category of processes where the concrete really helps the reinforcement to stay in the correct position um, and where no additional support material is needed as for example in conventional um, reinforcement cages. And um, secondly, we investigate a category um, which is basically the inverse of it, where um, the reinforcement supports the concrete. Kind of as an additional 
um, formwork or um, a kind of a stay in place formwork, which gives additional freedom to the geometries which uh, can be printed, for example, overhangs. And thirdly, um, and this is something um, I think that um, blends in nicely with some of the talks that we've heard today, but which I'm uh, not going to cover in detail, is um, an incremental um, process or in our in incremental processes um, where um, the concrete deposition and uh, the placement of uh, reinforcement by, for example, one welding happen, um, happen simultaneously. But I'm not going to talk so much about the third version, but today rather focus on two um, of these um, classifications or these two strategies. The first being um, reinforcement supports concrete. That is um, a strategy that I followed um, in the mesh mold research uh, um, at ETH Zurich. Um, and the second, the inverse of it is basically concrete um, supports reinforcement where there is um, first a concreting process and then a reinforcement process. So um, let's start with uh, mesh mold and give a bit of history of this project. Um, the inspiration to this project was really uh, threefold. Firstly, um, the concrete um, structures um, uh, or that the, the cost of formwork for concrete structures uh, really makes a significant amount of, um, of the cost share of the total costs. Uh, that is about 50% for, um, for simple geometries and it increases exponentially with um, geometric complexity and can make up to almost 90% of the entire costs. Uh, second aspect is the high amounts of waste that is created when uh, fabricating one of a kind formwork. And this is an example from the EPFL Learning Center in Lausanne. So each concrete uh, formwork piece is one of a kind and then often discarded after concreting. And thirdly, and this is um, um, I think still one of the large challenges in 3D printing with concrete is the integration of reinforcement um, into the printing process. So mesh mold there uh, went another way. The idea was that uh, a robot fabricates a dense mesh directly on the construction site, which um, acts as formwork to support the concrete while it's still wet and which um, uh, remains within the concrete um, after the concrete has cured and then acts as structural reinforcement. And this research um, started um, very conceptually with this um, um, spatial 3D printing process where material is extruded in midair and then it's cooled uh, down so that it um, solidifies and stiffens so that we can print these, um, these uh, filigree meshes that can be um, uh, can be adjusted towards the specific needs. So it can have different curvature radii, uh, different mesh sizes, um, different thicknesses, all according, for example, to the loads that act on the respective building element. And this was tested in the small scale. It showed very nicely that the high amount of, of um, con spatial connections really stiffens um, the structure. So this mesh weights in total only 120 grams, but supports um, over 60 kilogram of uh, wet concrete without deformation. And um, of course, this um, process also offers the possibility to differentiate the meshes according to the performative requirements that act on these. For example, on the left side, you see the, the undifferentiated um, triangulated mesh, but um, you can also make it less dense in the middle or um, deepen um, the parameter to make it more stiffer or introduce these um, vertical channel, channels so that concrete can be filled uh, into the structure. And of course, also on the concrete side, there are certain requirements um, to the tixotropic behavior of the material. Um, as shown here, the material um, uh, rests basically within the mesh and then as soon as kinetic energy is introduced by this um, vibrating device, the material sinks into um, the, the uh, shape and rests inside the um, formwork. Um, so this turned out quite nicely um, regarding the formwork aspect, but of course 
in structural um, demands, um, the, the ABS, the material that we used here, um, didn't really comply with the uh, structural necessities of the system. So that in a second experimental phase, um, we uh, opened up uh, the research to a broader uh, range of disciplines and we collaborated uh, with roboticists, with um, structural engineers, with material scientists and in partners from industry to translate the system from, um, from plastic into steel. And um, other than uh, the warm examples that uh, we saw today already, here we used um, semi-finished um, um, steel wires, so um, basically conventional um, off-the-shelf steel elements, uh, which of course kind of limits the geometric freedom uh, of those meshes, but at the same time it increases uh, the speed of, um, of fabrication. So these were really the first examples. What's compelling here is also that um, in usual um, industrial processes, you often have the machines being um, multiple times bigger than the object that they are producing. And here this um, principle is kind of inverted. So you have this miniature factory that's basically hovering over the um, structure uh, to fabricate meshes. And once these meshes are fabricated, then the concreting process becomes uh, quite um, easy. Um, it doesn't require uh, precision anymore. It's basically just um, dumping the concrete uh, or pumping it uh, into the mesh um, uh, and it automatically takes the right shape. Of course, uh, the surface finishing is then another um, aspect of it. So here, this was done manually in the craft-based um, uh, process, but we will hear more about automating this process later. So um, the example that I've shown you um, just now was based on two millimeter steel wires, which still doesn't comply with, um, with any uh, building codes. Um, so here we uh, evolved this um, tool head, incorporated more powerful um, components, and um, so that we became able to process um, steel rebars up to eight millimeter of diameter. So um, these were then also tested, basically also the concreting process uh, was being scaled. And here we uh, worked with the um, uh, material scientists together um, to develop a concrete that is basically, an, let's say an impossible mix because on one hand it um, should uh, avoid that voids are created within the structure, so it should be very fluid. Um, and the other um, hand, it should not like run out of the mesh um, to create material losses. So what the um, scientists came up with was a mix that's called uh, spaghetti and meatballs. So basically it has large aggr aggregates, uh, recycled aggregates um, that um, that make the um, uh, structure denser, and then um, fibers that are clocking the uh, mesh openings. And um, then again, we had this surface finishing part uh, using um, a shotcrete and produced the first um, demonstrators, uh, which were part of a larger structure. And this larger structure um, was then um, going to be erected at the DFAP house in Zurich. And the DFAP house is a large scale demonstrator for digital building technologies and it consists of a whole variety of uh, processes, starting with a, a robotically assembled um, timber structure that, um, that contains two stories, then um, the smart slab where the formwork is printed in a particle bed uh, printing process. Then the um, smart dynamic casting facade mullions um, were uh, that are extruded, and the, then of course also the, the mesh mold wall, uh, which carries the entire load of the structure above, which is about um, 80 tons. And the backbone itself doesn't take any load, so it's really um, the wall is designed uh, for the entire loads of the structure, and it was fabricated using the in situ fabricator. And um, I will just let this video run. I hope it runs smoothly, um, uh, which shows the entire uh, process. I don't know if you hear music. 
Ja, okay, perfekt. Ja, yeah, so this is the tool head with the electrodes. It's based on a resistant wire, um, a resistant welding process in the digital workflow. And then the construction on site where the robot uses these April tags to um, register its position. So the process is based on welding, cutting and uh, bending. Yeah, so now comes the concreting part, um, which is still uh, manual, labor intensive, and the concrete is just pumped inside the mesh. This is manual, but could as well be um, performed uh, robotically. The advantage is that it's quite quick, so it's done within the working day. And the material is sprayed to cover the, um, the steel. And here again, the manual surface finishing uh, process. So um, then the entire structure was 3D scanned and based on the 3D scan, um, the ceiling of the next um, group of the smart slab was generated. Um, so that uh, really a tight fit between these two structural elements could be generated. And these are some interior pictures and um, that is the entire building as it was finished last year. Okay, so um, now uh, I want to report a little bit on the inverse of this structure. So um, where the concrete re re uh, actually um, supports the reinforcement. And this is work that we have been doing in the past two years at the Institute of uh, Structural Design um, at TU Braunschweig. Um, where we have uh, the digital building fabrication laboratory. It's kind of large scale robotic fabrication facility, um, which uh, contains um, two uh, portals. One that suits, uh, is very suitable for subtractive methods, like you can see here, it's this giant saw blade that can um, cut, but that can be also um, employed with uh, milling bits and drills and so on. And then um, a high payload robot, which um, is very suitable for um, additive or formative processes. So uh, one of the processes or the first, one of the first process that we have been investigating is um, the shot creating process. And this is um, a process that is very well established. It's about 100 years old. Um, the advantages are that it can be sprayed around reinforcement, um, that it sticks very well to vertical um, surfaces, and uh, that the high velocity of uh, the projection compacts the material very well. And the downside is, of course, and this is something that you see in the video, uh, that um, shock creating is generally kind of a, it's like a rather dirty process, um, often comes with um, high material losses, and is rather imprecise and uh, very labor intensive. But um, in combination with robotics and with uh, sensor con uh, control, um, the disadvantages can mostly be eliminated and the potentials of this fabrication process can be multiplied. Um, so much for the technology. Um, in a recent demonstrator, we then developed a reinforcement strategy which is based uh, on this concrete supports reinforcement um, approach uh, and which is basically the inverse of what I've shown before. So the process starts uh, with an input geometry, um, some kind of arbitrary um, double curved wall element. 
which is then in a computational process um, modified to um, include these undulations um, so that every 40 centimeters um, a, a pre-bent horizontal um, reinforcement element can be placed uh, which over the entire height of the structure then creates these kind of vertical channels where then unbent um, reinforcement and in this case we use 12 millimeter um, rods uh, can simply be inserted um, uh, and uh, in an additional vertical printing process can then be embedded um, structurally um, and um, also automated, uh, autom yeah, autom automated surface finishing um, with using uh, different um, uh, troweling uh, devices. Uh, so here's, here are some pictures from the process. Um, the robot prints in a three axis manner. Then these uh, prefabricated um, rods are laid on only on the tips of um, these undulations. Then we uh, cut the corners um, to be more precise, um, just slide in the reinforcement from above, which is um, over the entire height, still very flexible, so it doesn't require any pre-bending. And then comes the um, covering process um, uh, where the, material, the reinforcement is then embedded and then um, um, troweled and surface finished uh, with the, um, the um, other 3x portal. And also here I would like to show you a video of the entire process. All right, um, and uh, so this is already also the end of my presentation and um, I want to make some advertisement on our own behalf and also for those who are interested in the research. Um, as the ETA, we are part of the um, Transradio, it's a, it's a um, DFG funded um, collaborative research center on additive manufacturing in construction. Uh, which we are um, running together with um, TU München 
and um, where we investigate several additive manufacturing processes on the scale of construction, as well as um, develop materials and processes and um, design and construction procedures. So um, we have a website, uh, which is depicted on the lower right corner. And if you're interested, um, you're invited to um, visit this website and contact us um, if you are interested in collaborations or so. And with that, I thank you for your attention and I'm also welcoming questions from your side. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Norman, for this impressive talk. Um, it's always great to see the scale in which you operate in Zurich, uh, but also now in, in Braunschweig. Um, and I guess that's, that's uh, an important thing to really go one to one. What are your thoughts on that? You, you started small scale. We saw that in the, in the first experiments with the plastic extrusion. Now, now it's real architectural scale. What does it take? to go from model into one-to-one? -one. Yeah, I mean, many of these things are, um, you can really test it only on one-to-one -one scale, but of course, this is also always a tremendous effort that you have to take in terms of materials and labor that is involved in these, um, in these large-scale experiments. So um, many of the things uh, that we are testing, we are actually, um, Kind of glad to test it at small scale first and as much as it's possible so um, of course certain things do not scale very well um, others do for example um, we can um, investigate uh, how to reinforcement can be placed and in a manual process or pick and place process and so on so whatever is possible for 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 the sake of um, um, being able to work with lean teams, um, we try to um, do on the on the small smaller scale, and then eventually um, test it up to actually verify um, that these assumptions um, are correct. Um, yeah. So, for example, we are actually scaling down again um, the the shotcrete process. As I mentioned, we mostly takes. Um, seven to eight people to, to, to operate an experiment. And we're now looking into how can we make it as small as possible so that we can, um, so that we can have um, valid um, uh, or verify research assumptions also on the smaller scale. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We have questions in the chat, Philip. Yes, I have two questions to add. Mm -hmm. The first one is, what kind of tools are used for smoothing and cutting? Yeah, um, so uh, diff different ones, basically. So for smoothing, we used um, uh, off-the-shelf products from uh, Rockamat. It's a firm that um, builds these handheld devices for um, cement plaster. And these are uh, basically simple. Um, or there's a range of products um, from uh, plastic discs to um, steel discs or um, these, I, I don't even know the name for it, um, these um, rotating blades, um, um, Flügelglätter in German, um, uh, that are usually used to, um, to smoothen uh, floors. And then for um, the milling part, we looked for, there are not so many um, devices that are actually used for um, cutting wet or like green state concrete. And um, that we just um, looked into um, milling bits, flank milling bits um, from uh, that are usually used in for other purposes. But now we are developing our own tools to, to, to be more precise um, or to meet more precisely the requirements um, of the processes. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And then the other question was, what kind of sensors are used for the distance measurements or what is done with a visible laser? Yeah, exactly. Um, so it's a, it's a simple laser measure, um, uh, laser measure. Um, it's a line laser scanner. Um, and 
it measures basically just the distance from the nozzle to the um, to the deposited material down below or to the um, to the layer, and uh, we use it um, in a, in a uh, feedback loop. So if the distance changes, so if the distance becomes too big, we we slow down the robot so that more material is deposited. And if the distance becomes too small, we speed up the robot so um, that less material is deposited. And this way, um, and in this way, we, we simply try to keep the distance, the pre-calculated distance from the robot nozzle to the um, deposited material always constant, because then we know that we are at the, at the exact height. And this can be um, very um, conveniently um, um, be adapted by uh, or um, adjusted by the robot speed. All right, thank you. These were the questions for Norman in the chat. Thank you, Philip. Um, you intentionally excluded the WAM aspect uh, in your talk. However, maybe Heis, do you have any thoughts uh, on how that uh, could be combined from your point of view? Yeah, yeah, I, uh, I was uh, glad to see uh, the project uh, um, proposal a couple months ago. Maybe it was there out there longer, but uh, it looked really nice. Um, I think we never really dove into it because we always feared that uh, uh, the printing of the lines is, is a bit too slow. Uh, I wonder what, what your take on that is. So we, we print uh, in, in a good day, we can print something like two meters, maybe two and a half meters per hour of, of uh, line. And um, yeah, I, I would say that slows down uh, the concrete deposition uh, quite a bit. Yeah, that's actually the, um, the main issue with it. Uh, I think these uh, two processes operate on different speeds. Um, uh, one possible way or an approach that I've seen lately in a publication from, um, I don't want to say anything wrong yet. I don't know actually who published it, but it was kind of a, um, an abstraction of the one um, welding process uh, where, um, where it's more kind of a stud welding process. Mm -hmm. So where you take discrete elements and weld them together so that you can create height at, 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 at um, higher speeds, um, which could be a, a valid solution um, to, to inc increase the building rate of the steel. Yeah. Yeah. So if you see the ETH uh, project where, uh, where you put down uh, a rebar like this and you put another robot that uh, yeah. puts down the dots uh, i would say uh, you can you can win maybe you put down another 30 centimeters each time mm -hmm. uh, with uh, yeah in in a like a 20 second uh, motion so that that sounds like uh, the the speed uh, that you need mm -hmm. um so I'm, I'm i'm curious i mean uh, also you know, I, I, I do see the benefit of a, a fully printed uh, rebar uh, because then you can go all organic and, and that would be really nice to see. And uh, maybe even, you know, you can you can uh, print uh, the the um, the concrete uh, outer shell um, so that uh, so that you can also keep the concrete in a, in a very uh, organic shape. But uh, um, yeah, it, it does feel uh, that it has a chance to remain academic, and if you if you make it more like a, a sort of a, a shared, um, yeah, a shared manufacturing methods with existing rods, then uh, yeah. then uh, I think it, it has more chance. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I'm afraid we have to move on. We are slightly behind. Um, However, uh, it's nice to see how the different project ideas come together today. Um, and I also see many connections. I have tons of questions, but maybe we can discuss more uh, at the end of the day. Uh, thank you again, Norman, for presenting your work. Thanks for inviting me.